Hi guys. In this section, we are still in the third chapter of the book, How I Became a Hindu by Sitaram Goel. The chapter is called Seeds That Were to Sprout. This for this part, I'll have to read out quite a bit uh, for uh, quite a long section because he specifically discusses Marx, Aurobindo Ghosh, and Freud. Now, this is obviously not the full spectrum of the discussions he did in the book. I'm obviously giving you a disclaimer that definitely read the book <clears throat> to get the full context. Um, I'm only taking a piece of the uh, section and giving you a fun advertisement for the chapter. That is, <laughs> uh, hope you have fun. And uh, interestingly, it, it begins with a very uh, interesting and controversial, if you will, uh, portion because his Sanskrit professor does not like his Harijan activity because uh, Sitaram Goel was involved in the upliftment of the Harijan community because he used to be a Gandhi Gandhiist. Uh, who knows what that Sanskrit professor's uh, reasons must have been. Uh, obviously, some people will con come to conclusions, but history is a little more complex than that. So we start with that little paragraph. Uh, about that professor's dislike for Harijan work, but then we go straight into uh, Sitaram Goel's points on Marxism, Aurobindo Ghosh, and Freud. Freud section is very small. Sitaram Goel writes, But he strongly disapproved of my association with Harijan work. In fact, he was not prepared to believe that I could be engaged in such a disgraceful activity when one of my classmates who wanted to praise me before him lodged the first information report. He called to praise me before him. He called, to, he, he called me to his presence and put the question straight to me. I told him the truth. There was no reproach in his eyes or words. He tried gentle persuasion with some instances of depravity which he thought was hereditarily ingrained in a certain class of people. I had too much respect for him to enter into an argument. But I did tell him that I did not agree. This great scholar and teacher fell seriously ill before I started moving towards Marxism and he died before I left college. I wonder if I would have wandered into Marxism and atheism had I continued under his influence. I also wonder if we too would have ever agreed one way or the other about the problem of untouchability. But as I look back, I am filled with grat gratitude for the seeds of pride in Hindu culture and history which he was the first to plant in my mind. See history so complex and and filled with contradictions and dichotomies. Uh, he wants to be proud of Hinduism, whereas he just had an instance of someone who instilled that pride in him, having a controversial position on, on caste. Now we can obviously uh, defend that person, saying not defend that person, defend this predicament, defend this uh, let's say bad quality of that person uh, with the usual arguments that. He was he was operating under the British framework of British mechanism and laws of casteism and that was ingrained in his mind, not the original what the caste system was meant to be. But who cares for now? It was it was perhaps due to the strong undercurrents of influence exercised by what I learnt at the feet of this Sanskrit servant, Sanskrit savant, that I was never able to part company fully and finally with the ideals and idols of my earlier days. Marxism made me renounce my faith in God as the creator and the controller of our cosmos. But my reverence for Sri Garib Das and the saints and Sufis to whom he had introduced me through his great Granth Sahib remained intact. I gave up Gandhism but not my veneration for Mahatma Gandhi. His spiritual strength and moral stature continued to cast its spell on me as ever before. And both Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda made me bow down my head in homage whenever their holy names were mentioned. This split between my intellectual perceptions and emotional dispositions was also due to my incomplete acceptance of Marxism. I had accepted Marx's historical materialism as an adequate explanation of the process of human history. I had accepted his labor theory of value as the source of all capital accumulated by human society. I could see clearly that the state was an instrument of class oppression. I could detect naked class interests hiding behind the cloak of social institutions, law codes and conventional morals. And I also came to be 
came to believe in the inevitability as well as the desirability of the proletarian revolution on an international scale but i found it very difficult almost impossible to accept dialectical materialism as a valid view of the world process i had read quite a bit of modern western philosophy to know that while materialism was deterministic there was an obvious element of teleology in dialectics materialism and dialectics could not therefore be reconciled i had referred the matter to my professor of political science whom i thought a very good marxist but he confessed that philosophy had never been his domain and that he had never studied dialectical material dialectical materialism next i had taken the problem to a professor of philosophy in our college he confirmed my suspicion that materialism and dialectics were logically irreconcilable i left it at that at that time but the ideological gap continued to rankle in my mind meanwhile i had added two more idols to the panorama of saints and sages in my private pantheon socrates and sri aurobindo they made a great difference to my intellectual turnout in the long run plato who made me fall at the feet of socrates figuratively speaking was a was a prescribed reading for me as a student of greek political thought but i did not stop at the republic the laws and the statesman which three dialogues would have covered my course i read practically the whole of plato in order to know more and more about the personality of socrates whom someone had so aptly described as the first satyagrahi adherent to truth known to the western world he finally rose to his full stature in the three dialogues centered round the last days of his life apology crito phaedo his wisdom as well as the nobility of his character left me spellbound this fascination for the personality of socrates led me later on to translate and publish the, th- these three dialogues in hindi under the title satya kama socrates my encounter with sri aurobindo on the, on the other hand came about almost inadvertently i had heard his name from my father who extolled him as a great yogi my father literally believed that sri aurobindo could levitate as much as 5 feet above ground but i had never read anything written by sri aurobindo nor was he on my list of masters whom i aspired to read some day the intellectual elite in the college talked a lot about spengler bergson marcel proust bernard shaw and aldous huxley but i had never heard the name of sri aurobindo in this exclusive club strange as it as it may sound i was led to sri aurobindo by my interest in sigmund freud the founder of psychoanalysis psychology was not my subject in college but my philosopher friend had aroused my interest in western psychology as he had done in western philosophy i studied all the six schools of psychology which were known in those days but i was impressed only by the depth depth psychology of freud our university library had almost all his published works till that time including his voluminous case histories and there were not many readers to take out these tomes i could therefore study them at leisure i wonder if i derived any intellectual benefit from them what i remember is that i started seeing all sorts of conflicts and complexes in my mental makeup i was it was something like what happens to an immature student of homeopathy who starts suspecting in his own self the symptoms of all sorts of diseases described in the materia medica my morbid fears made me approach one of our professors who was a well-known psychoanalyst he gave me a few sessions of free association the therapeutic method prescribed by freud i do not remember that they did me any good the professor must have soon found out that i was a victim of auto suggestion but i was surely surprised when one day he suddenly asked me if i believed in god when i replied in the negative he further asked me if i believed in a higher consciousness this could not deny without repudiating this i could not deny without repudiating sri garib das and the saints and sufis who always sang of a consciousness full of noor and zahur i did not know that the professor was a devotee of sri aurobindo he was not in a hurry to reveal himself to me all at the same time what he told me to start with was that though he had put all his good faith in psychoanalysis for quite a number of years he had now come to the conclusion that yoga was a more effective method of dealing with mental ailments i knew next to nothing about yoga i was only vaguely aware of the name of patanjali as an exponent of the yoga system of indian philosophy but that was all 
I had not studied any Indian philosophy so far, nor was I inclined to do so. The professor recommended that I need not bother about the philosophy of yoga. All I needed was to make a start with some simple expositions of practical yoga by Sri Aurobindo. He also promised to lend me some books if I could not find them on my own. My search for the writings of Sri Aurobindo led me to my old favorite library in Chandni Chowk. The college and university libraries had not so far acquired any of his works, perhaps because they had been published only recently. The library in Chandni Chowk, however, had quite a few of Sri Aurobindo's works. One of these was The Life Divine. I immediately went for it, forgetting for the, for the time being what the professor had recommended, and that was an intellectual experience which I will never forget. I still remember how I tried to read this great work by the moonlight of the ro- on the roof when I found one night that my lantern had run out of kerosene. What impressed me most at that time was Sri Aurobindo's full and very fair exposition of the philosophy of materialism in all its metaphysical and scientific ramifications, as well as life meanings. Here was a mind which was as razor sharp as that of Marx, but which at the same time covered a large territory, a larger territory. As I look back, I can see that the great, greater part of Sri Aurobindo's vast vision was, as expounded in The Life Divine, was beyond my grasp at that time. The heights to which he rose as a witness of the world process and the drama of human destiny left me literally gasping for breath. But this much was clear at the very start that his concept of man had dimensions which were radically different from those I had come across in any other system of thought. He was not dealing with man as a producer and consumer of material goods. He was not dealing with man as a member of a social or political or economic organization. He was not dealing with man as a rational animal or a moral aspirant or an aesthete. Man was all these according to him. Man was all these according to him. But man was also much more at the same time. He was a soul effulgent with an inherent divinity which alone could sustain and give meaning to the outer manifestations of the human personality. And the promise made by Sri Aurobindo regarding the ultimate destiny of the human race was far more stupendous than that held out by Marx. The international proleta- proletarian revolution anticipated and advocated by Marx was to lead to a stage at which mankind could engage itself in rational, moral and aesthetic endeavors free from the distortions brought about by class interests. But the supermentalization of the mental, vital and physical nature of man envisaged and recommended by Sri Aurobindo would enable mankind to bridge the gulf between human life as a terrestrial turmoil and human life as a spiritual self-existence. The conceptual language I am using now to draw the distinction between Marx and Sri Aurobindo was not accessible to me in those days. Most of this clarity is wisdom by hindsight, but howsoever vague and incohate my vision might have been at that time, I did feel that Sri Aurobindo was talking about fundamentally different dimensions of the universe and human life. The gulf between my mundane interests and the grand aspirations dictated by Sri Aurobindo's vision was very wide and I could hardly muster the care or the courage to cross over. But in the inner recesses of my mind, I did become curious about the nature of the universe, about man's place in it and about a meaningful goal of human life. My problem now was to reconcile Sri Aurobindo with Marx, in that order. Marx of course came first. He was the exponent par excellence of the social scene with which I was primarily preoccupied as well as extremely dissatisfied. Sri Aurobindo had to be accommodated somewhere, somehow, in the system of Marx. The reconciliation was achieved by me several years later to my own great satisfaction. I came to the conclusion that while Marx stood for a harmonized social system, Sri Aurobindo held the key to a harmonized human personality. The ridiculousness of this reconciliation did not dawn on me even when a well-known exponent of Sri Aurobindo to whom I presented it as an intellectual feat dismissed it with a benevolent smile. I dismissed the exponent as wise by half, because while he had studied Sri Aurobindo, he had probably not studied Marx, at least not as well as I had done.